Bring the kids, bring the neighbor's kids, and let people know that there is actually a skating rink right here in Rankin, and it doesn't cost anything. We love our community, and this is one of the ways we try to show it. Synergy is our youth group with students from 6th to 12th grade. It starts at 6.30 on Wednesday, and if your kids have not jumped in yet, they're missing out. Worship, preaching, discipleship, games, youth trips, and more. Come get plugged in this Wednesday. Venture Kids is our program for elementary age children. Every week is a new adventure in Venture Kids with Bible stories, games, small group training, and reinforcement throughout the week. Trust us, you want your kids in this program. They meet at 8.30 and 10.50 on Sunday mornings and 7 o'clock on Wednesday afternoons. Wednesday nights are full of wonderful family training opportunities. Venture Kids for the Elementary School Age Children, Synergy for Middle and High Schoolers, Preaching in the Sanctuary, and an Adult Discipleship Class in the Fellowship Hall. As usual, our nursery is ready to serve your little ones. Don't miss out on the action. If you're joining us online today, welcome. We do our best to make sure our presentation is as clean and accurate to real life as possible, and we hope you're blessed as you worship along. Feel free to comment and introduce yourself. We'd love to get to know you a little. We would also love to see you face to face. First chance you get, stop by and say hi in person. For those in the house today, we're so glad you're here. We're anticipating a day rich in worship, rich in the Word of God, and rich in fellowship. Make sure to find somebody you don't know and make a new friend as we approach the start of worship. You still have a couple of minutes. If you would take a moment and silence your cell phone, we would appreciate it. It only takes a moment and it might prevent distractions for those around you. If you want to know what's going on at Maranatha, the quickest way is our social media. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube to stay up to date and catch anything you have missed. Follow us today and be sure to like, comment, and share. It helps us get the word out.
It's time to worship the Lord. Let's stand up, clap our hands, and celebrate His goodness.
there's only one who died to save me. It's not okay for me to give, give my fealty and my loyalty to anything but you, Lord, because you purchased me with your blood. the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning. We're delighted 
to see all of you here, those of you that are guests. You have honored us by coming to this service. We're glad to have you. Let's pray together. Father, we commit to you this day and this coming week, asking that you will order our steps, that we will walk in victory and not defeat. Meet the needs of those who are unable to be here today. Touch those that are sick as well. And Father, we just commit every need in this room and beyond these walls into your hands and thank you in advance for meeting them. In Jesus' name, amen. Before you greet, look around for folk. We got a number of visitors. Look around and make it your business to get to those you don't know and make them welcome. Bless you as you greet one another. God bless you. You may be seated as we move on with our service this morning. God bless you. I will remind you that after the service, there's plenty of time for you to greet as many folks as you'd like to, and we hope you'll take advantage of that. Let me mention a couple of things to you. If you are a guest this morning in the seating area in front of you, there's a guest connection card. If you'd be so kind as to fill that out or scan the QR code and uh, either drop it in the offering when it's received or you can uh, drop it off at the information booth back there and they will take care of it. You have honored us by coming and we invite you to join us again on Wednesday night at 7. We have something for every member of the family and would love to have you with us. Now, those of you that have joined this service by live stream, watching from wherever you may be watching, because this airs literally around the world, we welcome you to South Georgia. Just north of Savannah is a community called Rinkin, and that's where we are. And you are with us in the second service of the day at Maranatha Family Church, and we welcome you to come worship with us whenever you are in our area. We're delighted to have you. Well, just another reminder, I say it about every week, we have the invite cards are there by the entrances where you came in this morning. Get as many of those as you can use. They're free to you. We had to pay for them, but we're giving them to you free to use them wherever you may go to do business, whether it's a restaurant, a dry cleaners, or wherever. It has the information about our church, our social media, all of that is on there, and just leave one of those and let folks become better acquainted with us. We're now going to receive our tithe and kingdom builders offerings. God bless you as our ushers are coming now. Father, thank you so much for your multiplied blessings to us. Thank you for what you've done for us and even things we're not aware of, you have done, and we give you praise. Now bless our giving today in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning, Maranatha. Thank you so much for choosing to begin your day in worship with us. Let's take a moment and see what's coming up on our church calendar. This past Wednesday, Pastor Bruce started a new discipleship class called Whole Person Health. 
If you're not attending classes on Wednesday nights, this would be a great place to start, and it's not too late to jump in. Join us this Friday, the 28th at 6.30, as we host Effingham's Case. This is a great community outreach, and we still need volunteers to keep it going. If you can help out, please sign up in the foyer and meet us in the gym at about 5.30 so we can get everything up and running. Ladies, if you have made plans to join us on our St. Augustine trip and you've paid your deposit, the balance is due by May 1st. Please make sure you get that taken care of. Also, for everyone, the annual brunch with the ladies' ministry is held on May 6th in the Family Life Building at 10 a.m. If you're able to bring food for the brunch, please sign up in the foyer. If you have any questions, just check with Teresa Ryan. Thanks so much for worshiping with us today, and we hope you have a wonderful Sunday.
I beg you to save my only daughter. Sir, have mercy. She's only 12 years old and, and dying. Please, please come with me. If I can only touch his robe, I will be healed. Gyrus, I'm sorry. Leave him alone, Gyrus. Jesus! Your daughter has died. Don't bother the teacher any longer. Don't be afraid. Only believe and she will be well. Only believe and she will be well. Who touched me? Someone touched me, for I knew it when power went out of me. suffered for 12 years with bleeding. Uh, I spent all I had on doctors who could do nothing. But when my fingers touched your robe, uh, I was healed. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Go in peace. Thank you. Don't you love those Bible stories? We're going to be reading this morning from Mark chapter 5, so if you want to turn there, you can, in whatever device, even an old-fashioned Bible. I uh, was coming uh, from my office, and uh, I walked by the nursery. I always like to look in there, and I looked in, and boy, it was just full. Both sides, a little, uh, we have a little nursery on one side and a little bit older kids on the other side. And I walked in, this little beautiful girl, she, she wasn't happy. I don't know what burden she had, but she had a burden. <laughs> she was crying, and uh, the nursery attendant walked over to me, and she put her arms out for me, and I'm like melded. And I took her in my arms and was holding her, and she just stopped crying. Just, that was it. And she, she just was happy until I said, I need to give you back. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't happy about it. But I think she's good now. We have great nursery uh, attendants. They are, they are so wonderful, and uh, both sides, they're doing a great job. We've, uh, we've grown, our nursery has grown, our, our church is growing, but our nursery is growing to the point that we have to have two and have to have a man for both services as well as Sunday school. So we've had a lot of volunteers, and boy, I just tell you how much I appreciate all that you do, because without you, we couldn't do it. Some of you ladies may have gotten an a, um, invitation we were we are privileged to a few months ago we were privileged to get a young couple who are stationed over at uh, Fort Stewart and uh, Morgan and her husband have uh, came to our church I met Morgan's mom on an airplane from uh, uh, Texas to back to Georgia and uh, then they ended up bringing another young lady with them. And her name is Beth, and next Sunday, they're doing a little shower. I, I asked our ladies if they would do that, 
And the reason being is uh, they're away from home. They're here in Fort Stewart, away from family. And it's, uh, they're going to be about a year or so here. And I told Teresa, I said, man, I, f I feel bad for them. I, I want us to do something. So uh, she got with her, uh, all the ladies, and they're doing a, a shower next uh, Sunday, April 30th. It's kind of a drop-in uh, on that Sunday morning in the coffee shop. I just want everybody to drop by. Even if, even if you bring a gift, you don't bring a gift, but just drop by and uh, make them feel like they're okay being away from home. Beth, wave at them. Where you at? There she is. There they are. <laughs> make, them, make them feel like uh, it's good. They're away from home. How you, if I had children away from home like that, I'd want somebody to love on them. Wouldn't you? I would. So if you uh, get a chance, do that. I love all of our folks that are coming in. They're, they're just super good. Hey, I heard uh, in our band, I meant to mention our band. What an incredible job you guys are doing. There. Think this week, maybe Donnie's been here six years. He came, and, and we didn't even have a musician. If they did, they were well hid. <laughs> and uh, he has built such a wonderful team of, of musicians and, and players. It's just been great. You love to see your church grow in that measure, don't you? Amen. I'm told uh, that an Indiana cemetery has a tombstone that's over 100 years old, and it bears the following epitaph. Pause, stranger, when you pass me by. As you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you will be. So prepare for death and follow me. Guy passed by, read it, underscored underneath it, uh, scratched his reply. To follow you, I'm not content until I know which way you went. <laughs> I thought that was pretty good. You know, by now, I love stories. I love to re-read all the New Testament stories that the four Gospels present to us. They're unique. Each one has its own touch, and each one has a great lesson that it wants to lay down for us. I was interested in Mark 5 because Mark 5 houses three different stories. And they all are kind of sort of integrated and related in such a way that makes them super interesting. It's, um, they're each one filled with uh, stories that to the natural eye looks impossible. In fact, even in Bible times, as well as in our times now, they look impossible. They are stories that just remind us that God is still the God of the impossible. That we used to believe, and I'm sorry to say that we don't as much as we did, that God can still do anything. He's still more than enough to take care of whatever need that we might have to take care of it. It mentions three stories. One, there was a man who was demonic. And as he went across the Sea of Galilee into the Gadarenes, he was there and made his living, uh, made his life among the tombs. He was wild. He was crazy. And Jesus went over and touched his life, and he was never the same again. He was made whole. And then they contacted Jesus, and he's going to heal the daughter of a man by the name of Jairus. And on his way there, he runs into a woman who has an issue of blood. Twelve years, in fact. And so we see that, and the problem is that Jesus took care of each one of those. Problems I have, and we have today, is in our society, the demonic man would have been assigned to a mental hospital. Or the woman who had the issue of blood would have been 
confined to a home and probably hospice called in and given up on her. Or the young girl, well, she'd have been carried off to the near cemetery and her life would have been done. But each one of them, God does what he does best. He is more than enough to meet every need that we have. So he heals the demonic man. He heals the lady with the issue of blood. And he raises the daughter from dead. What a God. Do you realize that is not some fairy tale story? But it's a reflection of the God that we serve today. That he hasn't changed one bit. Hebrews tells us he's the same yesterday and today and forever. And he reminds us that what he did yesterday, he can do today. He's not changed a bit. I think we'll discover in this passage that Jesus is certainly more than enough for whatever need you have today. Whatever you've brought into this sanctuary, whatever is troubling your heart, whatever has bothered you today, Jesus is still more than enough. I want to look at the account especially of the healing of the issue of blood. This portion of Scripture is kind of like a parenthesis. It happens between the Gadarenes and the healing of the demonic man and the raising of Jairus' daughter from the dead. It kind of is just for our learning, for our hope, sandwiched right in the middle. He's on his way to ha- to heal the daughter of of Jairus, and as he goes by, a woman who sees him comes out, and she touches him. Now, as Jesus was journeying that day, he was passing through, as the video showed us, a very large crowd of people. They were all pressing around on him and and around him, touching him, bumping him. I'm sure he was kind of, I've been in, in, in those countries, and they don't, we, we stand away from people but not them. They're right up on you. They just, that's their culture. And so they're all pressing all around him. And this very weak and timid and dying woman reaches out to touch the garment of Christ, believing that when she did, her life would be transformed. There are those in this church, in this world today as well, who need to reach out and touch Jesus. There was an old song we used to sing when I was a little boy, and it said simply, reach out and touch the Lord as he passes by. And I think that's the indication that we get here today, that our faith, that our reaching out, that our still believing that God is more than enough is a God that can touch your need today, regardless of what that need might be. I wanted to look for a moment at her symptoms. She endured such horror in her life. I did a little study. Her symptoms simply tells us that she suffered an issue of blood. It literally means that she was hemorrhaging and that she was bleeding from some part of her body. The word issue means a flowing of the blood. And so whatever may have caused this internal hemorrhaging in her life She was sick. Now, we sometimes read stories like this, and because we race to the end of it, we tend to forget the trauma that she might have gone through. Her suffering was that this constant flowing of the blood such as this would have caused her untold suffering. In fact, when we look at some of the areas in which she suffered, it gives us an idea of that. She suffered physically, most of all. That was a terrible thing. From this constant blood loss, this poor woman would have been weak. She would have been anemic. She would have been pale. In fact, the video, when we showed it, I I was looking through the Internet trying to find a video to start with. And when I saw this, when it kind of depicted what I would feel like this woman would be, her face was pale. She was She was light-colored, her eyes dark from the sufferings that she had gone through. And here she is, suffering. She would have had no energy. She certainly would, uh, the least uh, of efforts, even coming to Jesus, would have took more out of her than she probably could bear. 
She would have been a, a weak and pathetic uh, kind of creature. One version says that she had a plague. It's the same word that's used for or translated whip. Now, I thought that was interesting because it's almost as if this disease, this scourge, has just constantly beat on her and beat her down. You know what it is, <clears throat> pardon me, to be sick or to have something wrong, whether it be physical or mental or whatever it is, and it just beats you down and down and down until you feel like you can't make it, until you feel like you can't put one foot in front of another. I understand that, and I'm sure that, that you do as well. And then she suffered at the hands of the doctors. These doctors were not in the same sense that we think of doctors, but probably a, well, for a better lack of term, just a bunch of quacks, maybe even witch doctors, family medicine people. And they had all sorts of superstitious remedies. Now, I took time. I wanted to write one down. This was from Rabbi Jochanan, who, who gives us an idea of what she went through. Listen to this. Take of gum, Alexandria, of alum, and of crocus hortense. I don't even know what he's talking about. The weight of a zuzi each. Let them be bruised together and given in wine to the woman that had the issue of blood. But if this fail, take Parisian onions, nine logs, boil them in wine, and give it to her to drink and say to her, Arise from thy flood. But should this fail, set her in a place where two ways meet. Let her hold a cup of wine in her hand. Let somebody come up behind her and frighten her. And say to her, arise from thy flux. But should this do no good, take a handful of cumin and a handful of crocus and a handful of Greek. Let these be boiled and give her to drink and say to her, Arise from thy flux. But should this also fail? Sound like some of the doctors we go to today, don't we? <laughs> well, we're going to try this, but if it doesn't work, we're going to try that. And if it doesn't work, we'll try something else. I'm afraid if I'd have been sitting in, in a forked way and somebody jumped up behind me and scared me, I believe that'd been the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> dig seven trenches and burn them in them some cuttings of vines not yet circumcised. That's vines that are not yet four years old. And let her take in her hand a cup of wine and let her be led from this trench and set down over that. And then let her be removed from that and set down on another. And each removal say to her, arise from thy flux. I was almost exhausted reading that. And I thought to myself, if she wasn't well, at least she'd be drunk. <laughs> she doesn't drink enough wine, she'd have been out. So I figured they didn't know exactly what was wrong with her so that they could get her drunk enough, they could figure it all out. I don't know. It's hard for us to imagine the kinds of indignities that those doctors put her through. Now, if that's the case, and it was, she has suffered such ingraces at the hands of those men. Now, she suffered not only that way, but she suffered socially. Now, according to Scripture, at this point, she probably really couldn't have been married because through her physical contact, her husband would have been defiled. If she had somehow been married at a very young age because they, <clears throat> they believed that by her age and the, and the way it should have been, she probably was just out of puberty when this began, he would have been forced to divorce her. So either way, she'd be without a husband. She couldn't work around other people because of her defilement. And I would think that most of this probably reduced her life to kind of a begging uh, maybe even scraps of, of food from people 
and uh, even at a distance, and her condition left her on the fringes of society. Some people would think that wouldn't matter, but I, I enjoy being around people, so it would be hard for me to do that. I love people. Not only did she do that, but she suffered uh, emotionally. Since the Bible says that she had had this disease for like 12 years, considering the average span, I, I told you a moment ago, in those days it'd be safe to assume that she, she probably started this sometime after puberty. And so she's lived most of her life living and moving from one rejection to another. I'm going to tell you something. Rejection hurts. Rejection makes us feel lonely and isolated and full of despair, desperate in our lives. So this is the kind of woman. Scripture takes time to give us a kind of a picture of what this woman must have been suffering. I think she probably suffered even religiously. You might not think much about that, but under the law of Leviticus in chapter 15, this woman was considered unclean because of that. So anything or anyone that she touched would also be considered unclean. So that left her out. As a result, she couldn't mingle with people. She couldn't hang out with people, uh, not, not anybody in public. And, and if she did, they would be caused to be defiled as well. So this is tough. She couldn't go to the women's temple court because she couldn't defile them as well. She was unclean. In fact, much like, a, like the law of Leviticus concerning lepers, she would have had to announce it. I'm unclean. I'm unclean. So everybody gets to know that you're unclean. Everybody gets to know that you've got problems. How would you like to have to go about your day and, and everybody you walk up to say, hey, hey, I'm unclean. Just want you to know it. I'm, I'm, I've got a disease. That's a terrible. And then in, 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 on top of all that, she suffers financially. Bible tells us plainly she had spent all that she had. Isn't that terrible? These quack doctors and their useless remedies had not helped her at all. All they had done was drain her bank account, dry her out. She's been left now penniless and destitute. I mean, we get a picture of an awful plight here. I think Scripture does that to remind us of how sin and our life often goes. Not only just sin, but how life in general often goes. She suffered. Verse 26 tells us that after all the doctors and all the times she had hoped that the remedies would work, they wouldn't work. And she's come to the place that she knows she's living basically under a death sentence. She knows that without some intervention in her life, healthy intervention, she's not going to make it. She's tried doctors. They didn't do her any good. She has no recourse. No recourse. I think that this paints us a picture of every person who doesn't know Christ. You see, lost people are defiled by a blood issue, a blood disease, and we need a transfusion today. If you're without Christ today, you need a blood transfusion. According to Romans, Adam has defiled us all by sin, and therefore all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every person is like that. It's a condition that has plagued the lost person since he or she entered the world, and we needed a transfusion. It's a condition that's made no better by the best efforts of a sinner. They're not any good. All that I tried, all that I hoped to do was nothing. I feel a little bit like Jeremiah who said we've dug cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. In other words, everything you've done, everything you've tried, everything you hope would work doesn't work. Only Jesus, they used to sing, can satisfy the soul. Most of us realize that 
we spent most of our young adult lives searching for the right answer and not finding it. I know I did. One thing to another, one broken sister to another, and it was only when I invited Christ into my life, he came to my home, looked me up, and I invited him in was the day I come to have a great blood transfusion. She's a picture of that believer who is laboring under a heavy burden. Not only does she represent those who need a great blood transfusion, but she represents those who've tried everything to fix their life and they haven't been able to make it. Even Christians who suffer from some sort of physical or spiritual or emotional or even financial effort who need Jesus, many of God's children are discouraged and defeated today. So what happens? I think she has a hope that she embraced, and that probably is the answer for us all today. Somewhere, I don't know where, she hears from some source. She hears about this man named Jesus. Maybe she has heard about him as he's gone across into the Gadarenes and cause a man who is known to be demonic and flail and break chains and live among the tombs at night, run in the garden of the dead. And yet Jesus speaks to him and he's whole. Maybe she heard that story. Maybe she heard that he's on his way to heal the daughter of Jairus and she thinks maybe, just maybe, It'll work for me. And yet, she has to endure what's going to be a traumatic time for her. She works her way through the crowd. You can almost know that she's afraid. She's afraid of a lot of things. If she's found out, there's a good possibility there's going to be a riot. If somebody finds out, hey, she's got an issue of blood and she's in here bumping and mingling with us, they might cause a riot. They might even in turn stone her or kill her. She takes the chance of knowing that she's affected somebody and maybe they will be disease ridden after this. But what I see in her is what I believe helps us all, and that's a determination that regardless of where she heard about Jesus, she knew that she had to get to him and that she had to come to realize that Jesus was her only hope. That's where most of us have to get to in our lives. We have to get to the point that we understand he's our only hope. Society can't help me Politics can't help me. Money can't buy it. Nothing. Only Jesus. And I believe that she believed in her heart that if I can just get to him, I could get healed. That's faith. She had to be determined because she demonstrated such great courage by approaching Jesus in that crowd. As we watched a little film, I can almost see her elbowing her way through, trying. Women were not normally tolerated, and so she would have been pushed back, and so she would have had to fight and would have had to get to her because everybody wanted to see Jesus. Everybody wants to know him, but not know him. For her, it was a risk worth taking so she could be healed. And she knew that Jesus would do for her what she could not do for herself. I think that's a place that we have to get to, to the end of our options, to the last rung on the ladder, to the last knot in the rope, and we realize, I can't do anything. I need Jesus. I guess that there's probably people who come into this sanctuary today and they have questions. Why should I 
carry this burden one more step? Why should I fight this battle even for one more minute? Why should I live defeated life for another day? And my answer to you is this. You don't have to. Jesus is here. He teaches us that we can call on him and he will be there. He tells us casting all of our burdens on him for he cares for us. And so she experiences this great healing power. Verse 29 seems powerful. When she was near enough to him, she reached out. I can almost see her trembling hands, bony fingers reaching out to touch the hem of his garment. The word actually touch means to cling or adhere to. So whether she, like in the film, just basically brushes the hem of his garment or whether she grabs a hold to it, it's not enough that he would have recognized it from every other bump or crowd or clutch that somebody would have. Then immediately, I love that, not four days later, not ten days later, like then. The healing virtue of Christ comes out, goes through her body, and that issue that has been a plague now for 12 years is gone. I love stories like that, but they're not stories of yesterday, but today. That the same Jesus who touched her that day, or she touched him, is the same Jesus who can walk the aisles of this building, the same Jesus who can turn a black heart perfect again, the same Jesus that can heal our bodies, the same Jesus who can meet our needs is right here, right today. What she had received, what none of the doctors and their costly and very painful remedies could give her, she got immediately for nothing. He was, she was healed. She felt it changed in her body. She knew something was different. It was personal. Just as soon as this woman touches him, he knows what has happened. Something has happened. Virtue has gone out of me. What do you mean, Jesus? People are touching you, brushing against you, bumping against you. What do you mean? Somebody's touched you. Oh, yeah. Somebody's touched her, touched him this time, but not with an elbow or a bump or a brush but with the finger of faith. And healing comes out. Virtue, he said, had gone out of him. That word virtue is the same word they use for power, power, righteousness. Something just that a brush wouldn't do. Something that just a bump wouldn't do. This was, this was powerful. This came rushing out of him. So much and so that he turned and said, somebody has touched me. Knowing probably ahead of time that she would have touched him, but wanting her to recognize that touch. Somebody asked me one time, said, why do you think he singled her out? And I, I reckon that he didn't want her to leave there feeling like she had stolen the blessing. I suppose that he didn't want her to leave there thinking she had somehow pilfered it away, but rather that she had been blessed by the Master. We don't steal the blessings of God. He gives them freely to us, and he did her. Wow. Can you imagine, just imagine what all she's gone through. For 12 years she's been like this, and in one instant of time he touched her. And she was made whole. Who touched my clothes? Out of the many who touched him, only one touched him with the finger of faith, and that was her. And when Jesus spoke to her, she was afraid probably of rejection again. Oh, no, I'm caught. 
Oh, no, he's going to expose me. I'm going to be in trouble. These people are going to know. I've got an issue of blood. I'm going to be ostracized again. Rejection fills her heart, but she doesn't get that from him. He reaches out to her. Notice what he does. He calls her daughter. I suggest to you that he did that because there was a change in her relationship now. She was just not a woman of Israel. She was not just a castaway. She was not just one whose blood issue had separated her and caused her so much pain. Now she was daughter. Now she was his. Now she belonged to the family. Now was her opportunity to be accepted. A lot of people come in church and they're afraid of rejection. They're afraid of what people may say. They're afraid of the person sitting on one side or the other. Surely I don't want to go to the altar, but I want you to know anytime that you come to this altar, you're never going to be rejected. You'll always be part of the family. That thing was profound. She was, for that moment of time, his focus and the center of his world and his attention. Some people say Jesus doesn't care. That's not true. Some people think he won't do anything. That's not true. That's what the devil wants you to believe this morning. He wants you to believe that you've come in here and nobody cares about your plight. Nobody cares about your hurt. Nobody cares about what you're going through. That's a lie, casting all of our care upon him because he cares for us. One of my favorite verses. And then I speak from experience. Jesus cares. He cared enough to come to where I live. He cared enough to reach out to me. And I was lost and undone. Drug head, alcohol, but he does it because he's that good. That thing is profound. When he calls her daughter, it signifies that they're in a different relationship now than before. That's because Scripture tells us once we call on him, we become sons of God, daughters of God. Once we call on Christ, we move from a relationship of lost, we move from a relationship of, of possession of worldly things, we move from all of that to become family to him. Daughter, he says to her, you belong to me now. You see, you got more than physical healing that day. I believe you got the word whole, uh, James tells us, pray the prayer of faith and the prayer of faith shall make whole the sick. That word whole there is a sense that makes the whole condition right. Everything becomes right. And that's what jo Jesus does for us, makes everything right. All of a sudden, things are gone that was there. Same word translated, we use the word saved. I'm not sure un uh, uh, unchurched people uh, understand what the world's word saved means, but he just makes us whole. He took a woman whose life was messed up and rescued her from all the harms and dangers of this world. They were kept safe and sound, really is what that word means, to become whole. And then he tells her, go in peace. His word lets her know that she has, has the right to accept that healing and go live in peace. Not afraid of defilement anymore. Not to return to doctors who would take her money and convince her of superstitions. But the healing, your faith has made you whole. Your faith has made you whole. That drives home the truth that her healing didn't come just from the touch of the garment. It came via the conduit of faith from the very hand of God. Some of you may be here today 
and you need a touch from him, maybe physically, maybe spiritually, maybe financially, and just like this woman, all you get from the world is promises and empty promises. But I want to leave you one more thought. I, I started to title this message, He's More Than Enough. Because truly, church, today, this story reminds us that He's more than enough. I somehow believe in our church culture today, we've gotten away from just the old simple Bible stories that remind us that Jesus is more than enough that He's here to meet every need that you have. He's here to save you if you're lost. He's here to bring you back if you've fallen away. He's here to heal your body. He's here to do all of these things for you because He's more than enough. Bow your heads with me. Father, today I presented to this congregation Your Word. Your word is important, more important than my word. Your word reminds us that you're the same yesterday and today and forever. And so, therefore, your word has declared that if we come unto you and that we touch you with the hand of faith, that you're able to meet our need today. Lord, I've made bold promises based upon your bold word. And so if there are those here today that are struggling, in whatever way, struggling, today you're able to bring about whatever it is that they have need of in their lives. The greatest trick of the enemy today is to convince us to go away, still carrying our same burden, still carrying our same disease. The great challenge is for our faith to rise up and say, Lord, I believe that you're more than enough. And I'm depending on you today. I'm putting all my faith and trust in you. I'm elbowing my way through all the negatives of my mind. I'm pushing my way through all my own self-diagnosis, and I'm coming to you. So today I pray that you're going to touch the hearts of those that are here. By the power of the Holy Spirit, bring about whatever it is they have need of in Jesus' name. First of all, while your heads are bowed, I want to ask you if you know Jesus, if you don't know him, you don't have a right relationship with Him, I'd like to invite you to do that today. It's as easy as just praying a prayer. That easy, Pastor? Absolutely. If you shall confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus raised from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So this morning, I'd like to lead you in that prayer. Is there one or two who would lift a hand today? And by doing so, signify to me that you need a Savior, that you would like to give your heart to Jesus. Anybody? One? Then let me ask you one more question. If you're here today, you have a need. It might be financial or physical or spiritual or it might be a healing need. And you just believe if that woman could do it, you can do it. You'd like to slip up your head right now. I'd like to pray for you. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Are there others? I want to invite you to do this. We don't do it very often, but today I'm going to. I did it in the first service. I want to do it in this one. You raised your hand, you want special prayer. I want you to slip out from where you're at and come down. Gather across the front of this altar right here today. Pastor, are you afraid that if you pray there won't be healed? I would if I were doing the healing, but I'm not doing the healing. All I'm doing is the praying. So therefore, 
I want you to come and stand right close because I'm going to ask people to come in and stand behind you so I'll know who's the one up front. Oh, yeah. Many people coming. Many people coming. Now, you move on in because I want you to be up front so everybody can get to you. How many of you know that Scripture says, if there is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray the prayer of faith, and the prayer of faith shall make whole the sick. Brother Branson has oil on, his, uh, on him today, and he's going to come by, and he's going to pray with you. I'm going to ask others if they'll come. Pastor Bruce, I'll ask others if you'll come. Just lay your hands on these that are up front. And we're going to pray as a point of contact, one for another. That's what Scripture reminds us to do. Pray one for another. And I'm going to pray right here. And I'm going to ask God to do whatever it is you have need of today in your life. And I want you to have faith today. I want you to believe like that woman that God is passing by right now and that you can reach out and touch Him. Father, in the name of Jesus, all these who have come to the front of this building today, I pray that you now, that you will bring healing into their bodies. Whatever they have need of today, let them reach out with a with the hand of faith and touch the hem of your garment. You are more than enough. There is not one thing that you are not able to do today, not one thing, God, that you're not able to do in Jesus' name. I pray right now for divine healing. I pray for a touch of heaven to be upon the souls of these that are here. Let your healing virtue come upon them. Oh, God, reach out with a hand of faith. Reach out, oh, God, and let the touch of heaven come upon them. Oh, I pray it in, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Father, I pray right now. Oh, I pray for Sister Corsi. Lord, lay your hand on her. Give her strength in her body, I pray. Lord, let her feel the touch and hand of God the, touching the hem of his garment today and bring healing into her body, I pray. Touch my dear brother, I pray. Father, I thank you today that you're able to do what needs to be done exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or even think. Lord, I thank you for it today. I thank you, Lord, for touching Susan. Lord, I know uh, this thing has plagued her, uh, but I know you're greater. You're greater than that cancer. You're greater than that cancer, and I ask you to touch her today. Lord, we prayed before, but that's just, that's just uh, before. Now is now, and we're reaching out by faith to touch the hem of your garment. I ask you to touch her. Touch out pray today, Rebecca. Lord, let your hand be upon her. Minister to every need that she might have. Lord, I pray it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for touching these needs today. Father, I touch you, pray it for soon today that you're going to work this thing out. Lord, every detail, I pray, God, that you're going to open the right doors the right way at the right time. Gonna bring that, that miracle of past in her, I pray. Father, I thank you for touching Bud and Betty today. Lay your hand on them. Let them reach out in faith and hold fast to you today. Whatever they have need of, bring a pass, I pray. In Jesus' name.
whatever need she has, that Lord, you will meet that need today. Father, you're the great God that cares about us. I thank you for her and her life and pray that you'll meet every need that she and Chloe has. Lord, let it be done in your name as we reach out in faith. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And this is all my Will you stand with us and let's sing together. service. We invite you to join us again on Wednesday night, seven o'clock. Now, Father, go with us as we leave this house. Keep us safe and in the center of your will in every area of our lives. May we bring glory and honor to your name. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed.